And who was like, you know, you come to a new city and, you know, I mean, you know a lot of people who come into, you know, your mom and dad's house. But also, who, who was becoming your crew that you were kind of now hanging with? Was it now Lee Morgan still? Or who was becoming the musicians oh, that were your peers that you were hanging around hanging with? Hanging around in, in, was Clifford Jordan, uh, Cedar Walton, Richard Davis. Mm. Bill Hardman, well, Lee, of course. Mm. But Lee was with Dizzy, uh, so when he first came, we played together quite a few times. Lee had a group uh, with, uh, that we played at Birdland a few times. It was a Monday night group, mm. and Lee was the leader. So we played there with Lee. We, I played with Herbie around New York for a couple of years. Okay. Uh, we traveled. Mm. And uh, of course, Yusuf Latif and Bobby Timmons was was always there. Mm -hmm. Ron Carter, Barry Harris made a lot of records with Barry, a lot of recordings with Barry. And Charles McPherson was here. He was in Mingus's band for a while. Mm. And Lonnie Hilliard, I just remembered him. Yeah, yeah, great trumpet player. Lonnie didn't stay around too long. He was busy. He had to leave. You were living in Queens. Oh, uh, yeah, I had moved into the city then. I was living on uh, 7th Street for a while. I lived on 5th Street for a while. I lived in Stuyvesant Town for a while. You know, I kind of lived all, I lived uptown in Harlem for where a while. Live, where did you live in Harlem? I lived on 117th Street, Morningside. Was there any jazz happening still there at that yeah, time? Yeah, there was a club up there at that time where everybody would. You know, Minton's had just closed down. But there was another place on 125th Street, and I can't remember the name of it. Not Count Basie's? No. Uh, well, Count Basie's was still there, yeah. Okay. But that wasn't really the place to hang out. Was Small's Paradise still happening? Small's was there, and that wasn't a hang either, but yeah, that was over on 7th Avenue at the time. But there was a spot on 125th Street that was like after hours, where everybody would hang after leaving all those places. Wells was another joint uptown. Mm. It was a lot so of. So there was still. You talk about sixties now. Yeah. So was, there was still a lot of jazz clubs in Harlem. A lot of clubs in, Harlem, in Harlem. Yeah. Okay. Harlem was happening, and uh, I knew some guys who wouldn't play downtown. You know, they played uptown. It's still time. like that now. Yeah, yeah. They don't even come down. No. Nope. They don't want to be down there. Nope. What was your relationship like when you came to New York? Now with the older drummers such as Boo and Max. And Kluke, what relationship did you have with them? Were you, did, was it, did you have a good yeah. vibe with them? Yeah, Max Roach and Art Taylor were very close. And I, you know, I adored both of them. I thought they were both, you know, geniuses uh, on the instrument. And uh, Art Taylor was accessible, you know. Max was just a little out of reach. And, you know, you just couldn't call him up and just say, okay, let's go to the turf or something and have some clams. Oh, and you mean as, as reaching out to him as a person? Yeah, yeah. He was, he was all right, you know, but you have to, you know, be one of his boys, you know, and, and I wasn't really one of his boys. In that boys. generation, too. But I was with A.T., but and A.T. and Max Roach were very close. So... I, you know, A.T. knew how much I loved Max, you know, and uh, so one day there's a place up in the 70s on Broadway, and I can't remember the name of it, that A.T. loved, and he had a, a little lunch thing arranged for Max to come up there and hang out with us, and I didn't know it, so he said, yeah, man, I got this a surprise I got for you, you know, mm. so we're sitting there, and we're having lunch, man, and Max Roach walks in the door, you know, and man, we had the best time. And Max said, man, make A.T. pay, man, because he's a cheap so-and-so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we walked out and we made A.T. pay for the lunch, but it was really great. Uh, that was one of my closest encounters, other than once I went to Max's house with, uh, he was still married to Abby at the time. And... Uh, we went up there and had dinner, and that was that was interesting. What was your relationship like with Boo? With Boo Hainer? It was it was good, and uh, 
wherever he was, you know, I would I'd go see him, you mm -hmm. know, because I th always thought he was incredible, incredible uh, band leader, father, musician. Mm -hmm. He did it all. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I used to go up to his house when he lived over there on uh, Central Park West. We, you know, we used to hang out a lot. So yeah. I used to go up there, and Art would be on the road somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. most of the time. And, you know, I used to go up there and hang out. And then Spanky joined Art's band, and I didn't have access to, to, to hanging to out the hang there it. like we did. But uh, then whenever Buhena was playing locally, you know, I'd you always go be there. Him. Absolutely. We'd go and see him and hang out. But uh, he did a lot of playing at Birdland. That was an old one on 52nd Street. He played there a lot. Mm. And he always had wonderful bands and there was always some of my friends from Philadelphia. Lee Morgan, of course, was there for a while. Benny Golson. Yeah. You know, in this era now, we de it's a whole different kind of sound that we're dealing with. And like, if you come to Dizzy's, you're gonna see like two monitors here, three monitors here, five monitors. When you started playing, the bass didn't have no monitor. Like, you guys you were know, playing with a different kind of level of sound. What, what, what? Yeah, you know. Um, and the bass drums are bigger, too. Yeah, they were. How did you deal with all, like, what, what, tell me the finesse of that stuff. Well, you know what, um, Michael, the, I, I kind of, I'm still in that era of playing with acoustic bass. So you, you prefer know? to play without a monitor? Yeah, with, with an acoustic bass. But I'll tell you, the, 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 the sound engineer here in Dizzy's Club, it was perfect. You know, like, I had a little monitor over here, but, you know, it put just enough piano in there that, mm. I didn't have to, because I'm a long ways from the piano, you know, and usually we're closer. It's a big stage there, so you get a little more space between the instruments. But um, I prefer the acoustic sound because it allows me to control the dynamics. When the bass player has the amplifier, or there's, there's a, if the piano is amplified, mm. Well, the piano, the bass more more than the the piano, because the bass usually they're adjusting yeah. their amp yeah. sound all the time. They like you know, and they feel like it's getting a little too loud. They turn up, but it's never turning down. They don't never turn that down. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about because like when you when you would see like Boo or Philly Joe, who are dynamic drummers, yeah, could you hear Poor Chambers? Oh yeah. Like, would, yeah. they, would, would they be playing over them? Because yeah. there's no monitors Well, Paul Chambers, I mean, those guys in, in, in those days, the bass wasn't as dominant in the music as it is now. It's more dominant now. And the bass is actually, b because guys, the technique of playing the instrument has changed. Now guys are using all their fingers now. So they don't have to pull the strings as hard. Mm. You know, so they, they're doing like this, so when they turn the amp up and do like that, I mean, they can run you out of the building, you mm. know what I mean? If they can just do like that and run But when they used to play like this, mm. they had to pull the strings really hard. And uh, at that time, the music would always start at a specific level. Of volume. To ease into everything. Everything was always easy. The drummers would always play the hi-hat in the opening statements of the song, like the first eight, the second eight, and the bridge may go to the ride cymbal, then back to this for the last eight, mm. and then to the ride cymbal. And that's why they call it a ride cymbal, because it, it's the ride. But nowadays, the song starts. Start around that ride. They start out over mm. here, and they end up over here. So th there's no dynamic change from this to that. So the bass has to make a, I mean, you know, you're playing like re really quiet when you're over here. It's, it's much quieter than when you get to the big cymbal, which mm. goes all over everywhere. Do you feel the, mu the way that cats play jazz now is much louder? Yeah, it is, it's louder. And uh, louder most, and better or just louder? Well, most people don't have any problem with it, but drummers used to be able to control the volume of, of, and the dynamics of the music. Like Buhena, when Buhena played, he'd always hit doosh, I mean a big loud one, and mm. then he would sneak in under that, it would be like, and you'd be looking for him, where is he? He'd be down, but he'd mm. be playing, but he'd be down real low. And it would start like that, and he would build up to solo, and then boom, a big bang at the end of that chorus, and then he'd start again down very low. So there was some dynamics 
that were played and it was really stressed with him especially. Uh, and uh, he was probably the swingingest guy you ever want to hear, mm. you know. And his dynamics were wonderful because he used to do that with a big band, you know, and he'd do it with a small group as well. So the music has changed because it, it starts out louder now than it would ordinarily, uh, like 30 years ago. Warm into it. Yeah. Then you have these levels that sometimes the music just starts out at one level and stays there through the whole song. And uh, a lot of, because it's not necessary to, to, to have control of it, mm. the volume of the music like it was in those days. The drummer controlled the dynamics. I don't know if he left before you came to New York. Did you, did you have any kind of vibration with Kluke? Did you get to be yeah, around him a little bit? Yeah, I did. What kind of, what kind man, of person Kluke was he, had, man? Kluke had the most wonderful cymbal beat. And he had a little small cymbal that he used to play. Now, he wouldn't have nothing like what, what I have today. That big cymbal, man, that was ridiculous. He had this little cymbal, and man, he could play that thing and make you just jump around mm -hmm. and make everybody happy. And uh, Kluke played vibes first. And he said when he heard Mill Jackson, he said that was it. Okay. He quit. Yeah. But he was a vibe player, and he knew piano as well, you know. So Clue um, came to the house once and had dinner one time. And, man, I used to love this guy because his accompanying whatever was going on was so special. And he never got in the way with, what he was doing and he never got to this point where like a lot of drummers sound like they're practicing because they're uh, keeping something going all the time and they're trying out things and all of that and a lot of times uh, with the, the the length of solos now where guys are playing for an hour and you know they yeah. got kind of crazy so drummers would get bored with what's going on if you've climaxed you've already done it as loud and you, um, as much as you and they're still playing out there. Mm. So you lose concentration and you start fooling around and trying things, mm. which has nothing to do with what's going on in the music. But Kenny Clark was a guy who played so sporadic and his taste with his accompanying. This was a cushion. The ride cymbal was kind of like a cushion that it just stayed through everything. Mm. And he, he accompanied himself and whatever was going on with his left hand. And uh, he had some things he would do with his feet too and Max Roach kind of took over and did all of that Kenny Clark stuff. When Kluke used to play at uh, Minton's and when he went in the service, Max took over. Yeah. And Max was like a lot of, oh, it was a lot of Kenny Clark and Max's playing at that time. But then after, of course, he developed his own Roach. Max Roach got to be one of the most melodic drummers I've ever heard mm. and could play solos like, and you'd always know everybody in the building knew exactly where he was in the music. Mm. I mean, it was easy to follow. And that was one of the things that uh, all of the guys always stressed to me, like Kenny Clark and all those drummers mm. always say, uh, you know, you need to kind of realize that you're playing for people Mm. And you should allow people in. Don't, don't let them. Don't play beyond where they can take it in. Mm. Always leave them a little space so that they can take in what you're doing. And uh, it's like Coleman Hawkins told me one time. Mm. I asked him to play. Uh, not Ben Webster. I asked him to play a specific song, and he said he couldn't play it because he didn't know the words. Mm. So the words with the songs. And with the drums, you got rhythms, and you can also tell a story on the drums, but you have to, you have to repeat some things so that you can let people follow what you're doing. Mm. If, you do, if you repeat things, they can follow you, but when you just go abstract and you just go forever and do all your techni technical things that, you, that you've learned without repeating something and repeating it so that people can get it. You're playing for people. You're not playing for yourself. You know, you, you're playing for an audience, hopefully. You know, you got somebody you're playing for somebody. And people are listening. Mm. 
So when it's time for you to tell your little story within this composition, you have to always remember that there's an audience out there and you're trying to play something that they can identify with. Mm. You got a drum, man, and it's, it's kind of hard to identify with a drum, but if you just say boom, 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 people can follow that. Mm. You know, but when you you know, after a while, I mean, it, yeah. it's nice, but, yeah. you know, but they can't follow it. They, mm. You can't take them with you, mm. but you can take them with you. That's why Max Roach's stuff was always special, because he could make little statements, and you hear them, and you say, oh, here it comes again. And when you listen to hip hop, and when you listen to R&B, you see what I'm talking about with the repetition. The hip hop, the bass line is same thing over and over again. Mm. And then the drums are punching with that. Mm. So you're getting the rhythm, and you're getting the melodic thing at the same time. Where with jazz, mm. it's two different directions. Mm. The bass is doing one thing and the drummer is doing something else. Then you got the improv, you got the horns that are playing a melody mm. or whatever. So it's a little, yeah. it's more complicated. Yeah. But with the R&B or whatever, you, you hear the vocal thing is up here. And if you, you can get caught up in the words, and if you get caught in the words of a song, then you don't, this is just there. You hear the bass and you hear the drums and, you hear, and the beat is there, but you, 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 you're really caught up in the word. You can follow the words. Mm. The bass thing, you know that it's going to be the same. The drums, you know it's not going to change, not in that song. Mm. So that's the difference in jazz. Mm. Jazz, you, you, you're freer to es express whatever it is you want to play. But you also have to really remember that you're playing for people. Now you used the interesting word that uh, you said statement. Do you do, is that something like when you're playing? Yeah. You feel you're playing. A, you're, you're you're making a. Absolutely. It's all a statement. Absolutely. You you're saying something. You're trying to say something that's got something to do with what you've been playing. You know, like everybody's playing on changes and chords, and they're making a statement, and within these the structure of this chord thing. You don't have the chords, but you have the place where the chords should be. So, and you have the, the bass thing in your head, because usually they stop playing. And uh, it's interesting when the bass plays with the drums sometimes. Bobby Durham used to be able to do wonderful things with a bass and him. Mm. Uh, and with that, the bass will help you to keep your place. What do you mean when you say play with the yeah, with a uh, drum solo and a bass, Got you. the bass keeping Time. the song See, oh, this, oh. and playing the changes, you know, and the uh, song. Okay. Just like the guy was improvising with a saxophone, yeah. you do it with a drum. And then when you have that, you can stop and there's some space. Mm. You don't have to play through everything. You don't have to play, like I would tell Jeff, you got ten fingers, man. You don't have to play the whole thing all the time. Mm. You don't leave nothing for nobody else. Mm. For you, which which... I wanted to ask you about favorite musicians you played with, but I don't want you to say, of course, Percy and Jimmy, of course, they, you know, they're your brothers, yeah, it's a different yeah. vibe. But for you, because I tell you, Al Foster's very picky over piano players. I've seen him almost get in a you fight know, one time. You know what? I'll tell you something about uh -oh. Al Foster. Okay, you're going there. Al Foster is a fabulous musician, number one. Yeah. I was playing with Tommy Flanagan, mm -hmm. Sweet Basils. Okay. So I couldn't make several nights, I had overbooked myself. So I asked Al Foster to come and play with Tommy Flanagan. Now Al had been playing with he and Joe, uh, uh, Joe Henderson. Yeah, the trio. With the bad check on the bass. We called him the bad check. Mraz? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, he was not used to hearing a piano. Who? For a long time. Al Foster. Okay, I get what you're saying. He's been playing with the bass and tenor. And Joe Henderson. They didn't have no piano for mm. a long time. And these three guys made more music than you could have with an orchestra. Mm. I mean, these guys were wonderful. Um, so I asked Al to, to play, and he did. He came and he played the first night. And after he finished playing, it was like three more nights. So when he finished playing, he started packing his drums up. 
So Diana, Tommy's wife, well, yeah, she, yeah, yeah, she goes over, she said, hey, wait a minute, you know, you got two more nights. He said, oh, no, I'm out of here, because the piano was too loud. Oh, okay. So he, he didn't like, this he's, Tommy Flanagan playing the piano. He said yeah. it was too loud. He's very picky over company, which I wanted to ask you, how important is a piano player's company to how yeah, it makes yeah. it easy for, for in your... Yeah. Pianos get in the way. Gotcha. You, you competing all the time with him doing that. Either you don't pay attention to it, or if you do pay attention to it. Like, I always have eye contact with Jeb. Okay. I've been playing with Jeb for a long time, and I have eye contact with him. And Jeb comps really good. He can comp his butt off. He can play. Mm. He's a good piano player, and he's, he pays attention to what's going on. Mm. But a lot of piano players don't. You know, they just, they're just in their own little world. And, uh, like, drummers can do that, too. They mm. can play without paying attention to what's going on up there. It'd be wonderful. Mm. But it's like a whole different street. How do you deal with the time a piano player has? Because, okay, I named three piano players you played with. You played with Herbie Hancock. Mm -hmm. You played with Barry Harris. Mm -hmm. You played with Cedar Walton. They have complete different time. They do. In how they play. Barry's, like, behind yeah. the beat, kind of. Yeah. Herbie more on the... the yeah. How do you deal with adjusting yourself to the time yeah. a person has and how they comp and how they also solo? Well, does it, like and does you it say, affect you? you? It's true. Barry will pull you down if you're not careful. Because he like Leroy to be yeah. kind of... But Leroy kind of stays... I mean, he's back there yeah. and he's pulling back, but he stays wherever the, the, the time of the piece is. Yeah. But Barry will... You know, if you're not careful, he can pull you back. Uh. And I used to play with Ray Brown, and Ray Brown is the opposite. He'd he go fast. Yeah, he'd pull your yeah. head. So you got to be able to stand your ground, so to speak. That's another thing. Bass player's time. I, I yeah, hate that term, yeah. but you have to stay where you are and try to get in with the bass, where the bass player is now. With Cedar and David, David, David Williams, Williams. David's way ahead of, of, of the beat. He plays way out in front. <laughs> and it's wonderful now, but because it's it's exciting, you know, it, it makes you like, okay, this is gonna rush in a minute. We're gonna be we're gonna be out of it in a minute. So it keeps you, you know, you gotta really stay. Is it enjoyable when 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 well, a bass player like say like Ray Brown? You said he, and Ray a, a, would other pull people you. told me he's very on top. Ray of the would beat. pull you. He would pull you, and he's Ray Brown, you know. So a drummer that's like a younger drummer. You don't want to. You don't want to say to him, yeah, that this is, this is Mr. Ray Brown. Mm. You don't want to say, "Hey, man, like you're getting faster." You can't say that to Ray Brown. <laughs> so what you do is, if you can play, if you can pull him back, you can pull him back because he's listening to you, but he's also pulling you. And my brother used to always say about Connie K. Went to MJQ. He said Connie was lazy. He had a lazy beat. Beat, but it was. Accurate. It's, he comes on the symbol. It was accurate. Yeah, yeah, Percy yeah, would yeah. always say, because he would tell me all the time, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, little brother, you're rushing me. You know, because he play, he's with Connie K most of the time, you know, and my stuff was somewhere else because I'm listening to the horns and all of that, and Connie don't have that. He, he's the one. He's in control. But when, the, when you get with a bass player like Brown mm -hmm. that would pull you ahead, you have to be really sure about where the beat of the music is because that way if you're sure he'll pay attention to it and he'll go ahead but it'll you're still slowly. be yeah it'll still be some room in there for it to stay where it is and that's that way with Barry too because Barry will get like back behind everything but Leroy would always stay where where uh. it should be Leroy is incredible man he's Holds it right in he there. He does. He sound like he gone with it. He, no, he, but ain't, he ain't really. He's not, no. And uh, it's really embarrassing when you're playing something and you end up, the song is so fast you can't play the melody. Like it's, mm. you know, that's really embarrassing for everybody. Everybody's like, oh, damn, man. And a drummer, man, you have that responsibility to keep it and then keep it interesting and keep it up, keep it alive and all of that. And it's a tremendous responsibility. So what do you prefer, a, a bass player that is on that... Russian almost on top of the beat vibe or a bass player that's kind of behind the beat. I like that one ahead Then it then it lets me go back, you know, so it, you like to push and pull. Yeah, it likes it, it keeps it like this and like David Wong is he's right on it mm. 
David Wong is an accurate dude. He, you know. Well, he comes from Mr. Carter, so he yeah, got that vibe. Yeah, yeah you know? he does. Ron got, yeah, Ron. Which was, actually, I was going to talk to you about next. Ron's a man. About the group. That's like one of the most, really for me, one of the great piano trio albums, Bobby Timmons. Oh, with Bobby and Ron? I wanted to talk, man, the, you know, the brushwork on I didn't know what time it was. And we the had boom, some, boom, yeah, yeah, the yeah, I know, we had a good time. How did you fit into Mr. Carter's time? Uh, Mr. Well, Carter was different. What, yeah. What's his vibe? What's the time like in the symbol getting Yeah, in? Mr. Carter's stuff is definite. You have to go with him or he go with you? Well, he's going to go with you a little bit. He's uh -oh. going to go with you a little bit. But if you're moving around, he's going to look at you real <laughs> weird. Vibe you out? Yeah, yeah, he will. And, uh, you know, you, you know that this is Ron Carter. And you know that he's right, number one. Is he always right? Yeah, he is. Okay. He's always right. And if you got some music, he's definitely going to play mm -hmm. every note on that paper mm -hmm. just like you got it. And when it's time to go, when he finishes, he's going to look at his watch and say, this time, this is over, man. I'm out of here. That's Ron Carter. And he's that way with his life. He's that way with everything. He is a gentleman. Mm -hmm. He is one of the nicest people I know and one of the greatest musicians I know. And, uh, you know, he, he's absolute. Mm. His notes are in tune. You know, Ron is, is unbelievable, man. And he, to play with him, it's, 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 it's just wonderful. And I had a chance to play with him last year for the first time. In, in Flushing? Yeah. Yeah, I was there. Years. Mm. That's my first time with Ron in years. Barry and Yeah, and and Mr. Curtis. Carter. Now, Barry is like, he's off in That his, was funny, because Barry really didn't. He gets on his own he trip. He was in his vibe. And you know what? He'll, he'll just play like quarter notes and be looking at you. But he didn't like them tunes that you was. I don't think, you know, you don't like. He doesn't don't like, don't like, like nothing. You don't even like Charlie Parker. He don't like nothing. Because you guys were playing all blues. I looked at Barry, I said, yeah, oh, Barry, oh yeah. shit. He's sitting over there doing like this, waiting for his solo. But I love him, you know, and I know, I know where he is, you know. I've been knowing him a long time. This has been too much fun. We got to do a part two. We got to get you back here. Well, let's do it, man. But, I, mean, I don't care. But you still, how, when did you move to L.A.? When did you make that move? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of left Sweden and went to L.A. because I, I looked at New York and I was so scared of so many great drummers and musicians. I said, oh, man, I ain't no sense of me going back up in there. Well, next time we have to talk about the whole Europe thing. Cause the, oh, Europe is yeah. where you got to play with like a lot of the swing, Eric, Ben Webster. <sighs> then you got to play with Dexter for many years. Man. So that's a whole nother vibe. Yeah, man, I played with Dexter, Stuff Smith, mm. Kenny Drew, mm -hmm. Niels Henning, mm -hmm. Mads Vending. Did you play with Don Bias? Don Bias. Mm -hmm. Johnny Griffin, oh yeah, Jam. Joe Henderson, Clifford Jordan. Mm. This guy loved tenor players. He would have like Jackie McLean, alto. Jackie was a little different. He had an alto player. He got Kenny Durham over there. I played with him. Mm. I played with Kenny here in the city too. Mm -hmm. Love Kenny Durham. That was my favorite dude, man. We thank you. Yeah, we thank you, brother. And we you know we brother thank man, you for, Michael. for being here with us, so brother man, Michael. I want to be just like you when I grow up. I'm serious, man. And no, Look at serious, you, man. No, I'm being serious. I'm being serious. I'm serious, man. That, you know, we thank you for still being out here and playing this music at that it's high level that you are. 78. 78, 79, 100. You going to make 100? We hope you do. I don't think so. I don't think I want to be around at 100. Because mm. I don't know too many people who be, like, smooth at 100. 100 be a lot of bumps in that. <laughs> And you know, you know what I'm saying? You can't be surviving all them bumps. Mm. So, you know, I had enough, man. If this is over tomorrow, I mean, that's it. Well, I don't mind dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. I got you. I got you. Well, we thank you well, for My brother says he don't mind dying because he's saving death for last. He said that's the last thing he want to do. <laughs> well, thank you very much, well, thank Albert you, Michael. Tootie, for thank all you. the music, for all the love, for all the joy. And we hope to see you again. Thank you, Michael, for making this a wonderful afternoon for me. Man. I love it.